Well, the topic for today is microcirculation and uh, immediately after that we will talk about edema. Without knowing concept of microcirculation, uh, I think it's not possible to understand mechanisms of edema. We will talk about filtration and absorption, but first of all let me draw our vessels where microcirculation occurs and show how the vessels can be divided. Let me zoom a piece of this guy's tissue over here and uh, see how the capillaries supply blood to this area. So here we have some cells and here I will draw an artery which is coming and carrying oxygen, water, nutrients, etc. First artery will be divided into the arterioles, then to the metarterioles. Metarterioles further are divided to the capillary networks and Finally, capillaries collect uh, into the venules, venules to the veins, and of course, veins go to the heart. And between the capillaries and cells, uh, of course, we have interstitial space. It's very important to note that in addition to all of these blood vessels, we have other vessels which participate actively in microcirculation as well. This is lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic vessel in this area is responsible for the removal of fluid and proteins from the interstitial space back to the blood vessels. Recall that the lymphatics return their fluid and protein content to the general circulation by coalescing into the lymphatic ducts, which in turn empty into the subclavian veins. It's just a typical tissue with typical cells. So in this area of the tissue which I have zoomed, the capillary exchange will occur. The term capillary exchange refers to all exchange at microcirculatory level, most of which occurs in the capillaries. It means that sites where material exchange, I mean gas exchange, nutrients, uh, fluid exchange occur uh, between the blood and tissues are the capillaries. When the fluid, oxygen, and proteins come to the capillary, some amount of fluid will flux to the interstitial space and some small proteins also can leak to the interstitial space, but in a small amount. But over time, the lymphatic capillaries will suck these proteins and also they suck and uh, bring back uh, to the bloodstream excess fluid from the interstitial space. Well, primarily, the fluid will be returned back to the veins through a venous part of the capillary. So I'll show here and explain this point. I will divide the capillaries to the arterial capillary and the venous capillary. So fluid is coming now and fluxing to the interstitial space and finally uh, it goes back to the venous part of the capillary and removes waste products. And these processes occur all the time, of course if a person is alive. So, at the same time, some small proteins in a small amount will leak to the interstitium, but uh, we don't need them there, and that's why they will be sucked by the lymphatic capillaries. These proteins cannot go to the capillary back through the venous part of the capillary. And lymphatic capillaries exactly do this job. So, the question here is, why these exchanges do not occur in arteries, uh, in a big vessels? So fluid exchange will not occur in the arteries because they have a thick wall. As you see here, arterial vessels have endothelium, smooth muscles, connective tissue made up of collagen. Uh, that's why arteries are not permeable structure and fluid, gas and nutrient exchange will not occur here. It's impossible. Arteries only carry the blood to the arterioles and then to the capillaries where exactly capillary exchange occurs because the capillaries do not have smooth muscles surrounding them. Uh, if you take a look at capillaries, they're very simple. Capillaries have a very thin wall uh, comprised only of uh, endothelial cells, which allows a substance to move through the wall with ease. Capillaries also have uh, the basement membrane, and these endothelial cells are resting on it. But a basement membrane uh, is very loose compared with the endothelial layer. And uh, in other words, basement membrane is very leaky than the endothelial wall. If you remember in a previous video, I have said that free ions like sodium, water, glucose, amino acids, some hormones can freely move across the capillary wall. But hormones which are bound with proteins do not. 
that cannot leak uh, through the capillary and the thelal wall. Let me explain to you a very important note about leakiness of the capillary membrane. The capillaries are divided into three types depending on leakiness of the wall. Continuous capillaries, also known as tight capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and discontinuous capillaries, also known as sinusoidal capillaries. I've already said that the capillary wall is made by um, endothelial cells and basement membrane. Let me draw here four cells, uh, I mean endothelial cells, and we will try to build a piece of a capillary together. Let's connect these four cells together and see what happens. So we get the first type of capillary wall, which is known as continuous capillary or tight capillary. Now there are two important things I want to point here. The little gap which I'm showing right now is called intercellular cleft. It's a place where two parts of the cells don't meet up so nicely. So if I draw a cross section of this capillary, intercellular cleft would be right there. And the second important thing which I want to point here is uh, these tight joints between the cells right here. And we call them tight junctions. And these tight joints are here in a cross section. Around this capillary wall we have a membrane, the basement membrane. Well, this type of capillary is mostly found in the skeletal muscles, gonads, skin and uh, of course central nervous system. These capillaries are a constituent of the blood-brain barrier because they have very tight junctions which do not allow to leak big substance into the brain. The second type of the capillaries is fenestrated capillary. I will draw here this capillary uh, over here and it looks like this. As you see this type of capillary has a lot of pores. These pores are all over the capillary, right? It's like our cells which we had before also having nucleus. Like our previous capillary is having intercellular cleft right over here. Uh, here we have the cross section of this capillary and of course here we have uh, intercellular cleft right here. So do not forget about membrane surrounding these capillaries. I mean the basement membrane. And the question is why do we need these pores here? This type of capillary is found in the renal glomerules. Logically, you have to figure out why do we need this port there. These pores allow small molecules and limited amounts of proteins to diffuse through the renal glomerules. And also, they are located in the pancreas because the pancreas produces insulin and glucagon, which are peptide hormones having large size. That's why we need to have these pores allowing them to be released to the bloodstream. Well, actually, all glands which produce peptide hormone have fenestrated capillaries due to releasing large molecules of peptide hormone. Here we do not have continuous capillaries because large molecules cannot pass through this type of capillary. So intestines also have this type of capillary.